our presentation at this time is going to be on um, Pioneer number 15 on our timeline of 27 pioneers, J.H. Wagner, Joseph Harvey Wagner. The issue of Lest We Forget that is on this gentleman is volume 4, number 4. It has a lead article by him entitled Justification by Faith. Uh, he wrote on that uh, in one of the books that he, he published. <clears throat> so we're going on to the handout on him now. Some highlights of the life of Joseph Harvey Wagner, 1820 to 1889. Um, Joseph Harvey Wagner was born in 1820 in Pittston, Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. And if you look uh, on a map, this is in the Wilkes-Barre, Scranton area of Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania there. He lived his early life in Pennsylvania and in Illinois, and he learned the printer's trade. Uh, he married in 1845 at the age of 25, Marietta Hall in Portland, Illinois. And with her, he had 10 children from the years 1846 to 1862. He moved uh, sometime after marrying her in Illinois to Michigan, I mean, I'm sorry, to Wisconsin, just north of Illinois there. And he began his own publishing business, editing and publishing a political newspaper in Baraboo, Baraboo is northwest of Madison. At that time, he was a Baptist. Some six years after he married, uh, December of 51, he, at the age of 31, heard the third angel's message from H.S. Case and W. Phelps. There is an article uh, in the Review and Herald written 10 years later that was signed by... J. H. Wagner, Joseph Bates, James White, J. B. Frisbee, J. N. Loughborough, Emmy Cornell, E. Shortridge, Moses Hull, and John Byington. Now, if you look at the names, they're not in any alphabetical order. I'm not sure why they're in the order exactly, <clears throat> starting with Wagner and ending with Byington, but it seems apparent that Wagner wrote this article, even though it was signed by these other men. And this is how he describes. Um, things at that time. It was, this is in the June 11th, 1861 Review and Herald, page 21, paragraph 3. If we go back a period from six to nine years, so that would take uh, from six to nine years from 1861 would be anywhere from 1852 to 1855 through that period of time. If we go back a period of six to nine years, we find the believers in the third angel's message, few in number, very much scattered, and in no place assuming to take the name of a church. They had no name for themselves. They were believers in the third angel's message. They, they were first believers in the advent, and they accepted the third angel's message as the explanation for the disappointment, the Sabbath and the sanctuary, but they had no name for themselves as a church. Our views of the work before us were then mostly vague and indefinite some still retaining the idea adopted by the body of Advent believers in 1844 with William Miller at their head that our work for the world was finished and that the message was confined to those of the original Advent faith. Closed door, shut door type of idea. Um, there's multiple ways to interpret shut door, but that's one way that they, that they understood it. Continuing, so firmly was this belief that one of our number was nearly refused the message, that, by that he means the third angel's message, the individual presenting it having doubts to the possibility of his salvation because he was not in the 44 move. Now, when you look at the statements about this experience, Ellen White actually quotes this section of the Review and Herald. In, it's quoted for you in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 64. And after she quotes this, this statement that, that was written in the review, Ellen White in, adds this. To this I need only to add that in the same meeting, in which this person didn't know whether he could be saved or not because he wasn't in the 44 move, <laughs> um, in the same meeting in which it was urged that the message could not be given to this brother, a testimony was given me through vision to encourage him to hope in God 
and to give his heart fully to Jesus, which he did then and there. Now, Arthur White in, in Ellen White's biography states that this brother that Ellen White refers to, and in the words of the review article, um, one of our number that apparently J.H. Wagner was writing actually referred to Wagner himself. So he, he had experienced an encounter with the third angel's message being preached, but the person presenting it didn't even know whether it could do him any good because he wasn't in the 44 movement. Ellen White had a vision, and the vision was that he should give his, put his hope in God and give his heart to Jesus, and he did it. So <clears throat> that's how he joined the third angel's message. 1853, age of 33, he dedicated himself full-time to spreading the third angel's message, especially writing and editing. So we can see that 53, then, would have been um, eight years prior to that, um, eight or nine years prior to that article that he wrote there in 61. So he's, he's now dedicating himself after he actually accepted the message there. 1854, at the age of 34, he writes a book entitled The Law of God, Testimony of Both Testaments. And that was published uh, by um, the review, which in 54, where was the review in 54? Do you remember? When did they move to Michigan? 55. So where were they before they went to Michigan? Rochester, Rochester exactly. So they were, they were printing some things out of Rochester as well. Um, the next year, in 55, his son, Ellet Joseph, which is the best known of the ten children, was born when J.H. was, th when, uh, J. H. was 35 years old. Um, his involvement, Brother Wagner's involvement with the early work, was described by J.O. Corliss in 1923, as you look at the footnote, it's a Review and Herald 1923. The entire reference is given for you there. Uh, his involvement was, was described this way. Speaking of, of John Harvey Kellogg, Joseph Harvey Kellogg, um, his engagement in religious work soon called him to Michigan, where he became associated with elders White, Andrews, and Smith. This move seemed truly providential, since at that time the cause was not firmly established as related to doctrines. Even among the leaders, considerable difference of opinion prevailed on some points of faith that are now held vital. In company with these brethren and Mrs. White, Elder Wagner held meetings for Bible study on the points in question, and after much deep thought and free counsel together, they would all kneel and plead the help of God for a correct understanding of what had been studied. <clears throat> At the next meeting, Elder Wagner would give clear-cut expression to the views arrived at, which, taken in conjunction, in conjunction with the special instructions received from God through Sister White, would be accepted by all as positive truth. After this manner, most of the fundamentals of this truth, of the truth as now held, became a part of the message. So here's a man who was a publisher and an editor, and as he met with these early people, in those early years of the of the 1850s, and they studied these things out, he was the one that seemed to be commissioned, or at least volunteered, to write them together, pull them together in written form, and it seemed to be a, a clear guide in that. So if I if I perceive what was happening, you know, the early years of the movement, of the Advent movement, was in New England, centered in New England, and the early Groups of Sabbath-keeping Adventists were also in New England. Washington, New Hampshire being the church where we really consider to be the first one. New England, New York. Okay, but now we have someone who's over in Wisconsin. <laughs> and after the work moves from New York to Michigan, there's actually there's actual further development of doctrinal understanding, according to what Corliss is describing here. Didn't all happen in those Bible conferences in the 40s, the Sabbath conferences and things like that. But actually there were also uh, things that were being processed and developed in the 1850s. 1857, he's 37 years old. 
and he publishes a book, Nature and Tendency of Modern Spiritualism. What had happened just the previous decade, you remember? 1840s in Hyde, New York? Was it, was it Hyde? Oh, the, 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 Fox, the Fox sisters knocking. Another, another outburst of spiritualism in, the, in, in what was then the modern age. And so they felt very clearly, again, one of the landmark truths is the non-immortality of the wicked, that man is not naturally immortal, and when he dies, he sleeps. So they're wanting to expose the fallacy of this whole movement, which um, has that lessened in the year since 1844? No, it's flooding the world now. In, in this country particularly, the New Age and Hollywood's themes and all of this, it is just pervasive. Uh, and so it's, it's still very much a vital, uh, vital message. 1859, age of 39, published another book entitled The Kingdom of God, A Refutation of the Age to Come. Uh, the belief that there would be a millennium on this earth, um, that there would be a millennium before Christ comes. The earth would get better and better. 1860. April the 19th, he's 40 years old, and Ellen White's first letter to him arrives. And in the index of her letters, <clears throat> there's a total of five that she writes to him. And this begins to introduce something to us about his home situation that marks this man's story, pretty much the rest of, of the life that we're going to look at here. But again, it shows you, it, it will show you, if you put it into its context, that just as the people in the Bible that God used in tremendous ways, they had families, and they had family situations, and sometimes his family situations were not always perfect. <clears throat> One of the most dysfunctional families in the Bible is the family of jo Jacob. If you look at what happened there with, with, with two wives and the wives' maids, <laughs> So you have children from four women, and Jacob's family, which, which we get the 12 tribes from, you can imagine some of the issues. You just look at the names of the, of, the, of the children as they were named, as they were born, and you get a little idea. But Ellen White writes to him, and she speaks of his home troubles. She actually says that his wife is a medium for Satan to work through to destroy your influence and the influence of her continual fretfulness in finding fault is ruinous to your children. This is actually from an unpublished letter that was brought um, into some published form by the recent biography on E.J. Wagner, showing the background of the family that he came from and speaking about his mother in this light. So we can see clearly that um, J.H.'s wife <clears throat> is not a positive spiritual influence in the family. And this apparently impacted how the children were dealt with and actually whether the children were able to stay in the home long term even. And if you trace the story through, thank you, if you trace the story through you will find um, that, that the oldest child actually um, once he gets of age he disappears from the scene and the family actually loses track of him. So as often happens with a difficult family situation, some children sort of disown their family. And that may have been what happened with the oldest child. 1866, um, July the 20th, he's 46 years old. And he, he writes a, a column in the review of appreciation for the spirit of prophecy and the health message. And let me read you these paragraphs that come from that because I think they're very significant, a very significant testimony. I esteem it a privilege to say to all the scattered ones through the review that since hearing Sister White's testimony on the health reform at the conference, my heart has continually rejoiced that God has granted us this precious gift for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, look at the date, 1866. When was Ellen White's first vision on health? 
63, three years before. But this conference that he's referring to in 66, they voted a resolution on health reform. And they also voted to begin an institution. Okay? As we will reference here at the end of these, this. But, so that's the background for it. Visions on Health have just come three years before. They're, they're adopting it as a body, an official resolution, and they're going to go forward in a, in a practical way with an institution of health. So he's saying, since we heard this message, my heart is rejoiced to God for this gift. What gift is he talking about? Spirit of Prophecy. Spirit of prophecy that has brought us this message. You know, that's brought us this message. Sometime Luke's warmness and formality have taken possession of my heart, and then I accepted the Lord's appointed means. Spirit of prophecy as a necessity. Sometimes the cutting reproof seemed to bow me to the to the earth. Maybe that letter from 1860 did that about his home troubles. You know, um, and I tremble before it as something to be feared. But of late I have looked upon it only as a precious blessing sent by a loving Father to be embraced with thankful joy. I have often felt that an attack on that point, what point? Spirit of prophecy. Backed up by the prejudice of the world and the churches united might wound us, some of the people, deeply. But that feeling, I trust, is forever laid aside. Never have I felt that abiding confidence in the complete triumph over all opposition of this branch of present truth that I have felt since the war has been waged in Iowa against the visions given through Sister White. The war in Iowa was this rebellion that Loughborough speaks up in his book, uh, The Great Second Advent Movement. The rebellion in, in Iowa against Sister White and the visions and this group sort of separated from the, Advent, the Sabbath Keeping Adventists and they started their own thing and sort of the original independent ministry back in the years of the pioneers. And they started their own publication and, and sort of went off. And they they sort of, they don't, the, the wisdom often in those situations is not to do anything, not to give them publicity. And they just usually will will uh, uh, die. Not always, but, uh, but often. Continuing here, uh, Wagner's comment. Very, very uh, positive uh, testimony. We do not profess to be pioneers in the general principles of health reform. The facts on which this movement is based have been elaborated in a great measure by reformers, physicians, and writers on physiology and hygiene, and so may be found scattered throughout the land. But we do claim that by the method of God's choice, read Spirit Prophecy, <laughs> it has been more clearly and powerfully unfolded and is thereby producing an effect which we could not have looked for from any other means. As mere physiological and hygienic truths, they might be studied by some at their leisure and by others laid aside as of little consequence. But when placed on a level with the great truths of the third angel's message, by the sanction and authority of God's Spirit, and so declared to be the means whereby a weak people may be made strong to overcome, and our diseased bodies cleansed and fitted for translation, then it comes to us as an essential part of present truth, to be received with the blessing of God or rejected at our peril. See, he's, he's, he's a writer, as you can tell. He's taking this thought in these long sentences, but he's, he's showing you the significance, the context of the message in the importance of it in the light of, of prophecy and how the whole spirit of prophecy has, has been used by God to do this. Continuing, since we could have been aroused to the importance of this movement only by the teachings of God's spirit, so can no one so clearly and str strongly impress it upon the minds and hearts of God's people as our beloved sister through whom this testimony has been given. Never was there a time, so to me it appears, when her presence and testimony were so much needed in the churches as now. And may the time soon come when all the saints will be privileged to hear it and to rejoice in the light. If any are tried over it now, let them study it, pray over it, and they will soon love it. 
What a testimony. And again, I noted that the Western Health Reform Institute was open that very year that, that he wrote this. So well written and uh, very significant to testimony, I believe, there from J.H. Wagner in 1866. Two years later, 1868, at the age of 48, he publishes a book entitled Atonement in the Light of Nature and Revelation. He's studying the atonement in a light that is not just scripturally based, but he's looking at it from a logical viewpoint. That's where the, the, the nature and revelation come in. And in the preface to the 1884 edition of this book, he stated how his approach was in this, in this book, in following the Bible only. These are his words, again in the 1884 edition. In developing the argument... We have tried to follow the scriptures in their plain literal reading without regard to the position of others who have written before us. Again, what's the topic? The atonement. The atonement, which will become such a vital issue with the 1888 era, with his son, and the issues related to righteousness by faith. That's the atonement. Okay. Um, it would be a pleasure, he says, to agree, to us to agree with all who have con who who we to all who we who are considered evangelical, and we have differed with them only because our regard for the truths of the Bible compelled us to do so. The reader may then question why we have departed from the beaten track in laying the foundation of an atonement by appeal to principles of reason and of law. In other words, why are, we, why are we looking at the principles of reason and the principles of law in explaining the atonement, what God was doing in Jesus Christ to win sinners back? And this is, what he, this is what he says. It's a very significant observation, and watch what he's doing here. We do not believe that outside of theology, a soul could be found who would insist that the pardon of a crime absolved the criminal from obligation to the law which condemned him for the commission of the crime. Do you see this point? In other words, in, the, in, in a system of law outside of theology, say in the, in the society in general, if a law condemned a criminal and there was provision for pardon and the pardon was granted to the criminal, that never abolishes the law that convicted the criminal in the first place. The pardon doesn't abolish the law. See what he's getting at? He's, a, he's appealing to reason that the atonement in the Bible does not abolish the law. See? Very, very significant observation. So he says, the power to pardon should be used with prudence and is always committed to those who are sworn to maintain the authority of the law. Who, who grants a pardon? The governor, usually, right? The governor is sworn to maintain the authority of the law. He's not gr granting a pardon to absolve, a, <laughs> to, to destroy the law. So, he continues, Our positions, in part first, the first part of the book, have been examined by eminent jurists and declared to be well and safely taken. And we appeal to every reader that if the doctrine of the atonement did conflict with these principles, then the skeptic would have solid reasons for rejecting it. In other words, we're developing a, an understanding of the atonement that upholds the law. And, it, and the skeptics will have less reason to object to this view of the atonement than they would to these other theological views of the atonement that do, do away with God's law. This part of our, our argument, he continued, was the result of long-continued and careful examination of the ground. In other words, he had spent a lot of time considering this, thinking through the, the similarity between natural law and, and human law and reason and what is in the Bible in terms of the law and the atonement. Spent a lot of time examining the ground and it has been a delightful task to trace the harmony between these principles and the word of revelation. The more we examine it, the stronger are our impressions that no language can do justice to the subject of the atonement of Christ. The mind of man in this present state cannot realize its greatness and its glory. It is the prayer of the author that the reading of this book may arouse in others the desire which the writing has strengthened in his own heart to enter that immortal state 
where we may, through ceaseless ages and with enlarged powers, contemplate and admire the unsearchable riches of Christ. I like the way he writes. It's a, it's a flowing way and, and very meaningful way that he writes. J. H. Wagner, Oakland, California, August 1884. Again, preface to the second edition of this book on the atonement that was first published in 1868. Continuing with his life, 1871, some three years later, he's 51 years of age, he's appointed head of publications in Battle Creek. Again, a responsible position there in our publishing work. Four years later, 1875, age of 55, he moves with the Whites to California. Now, James and Ellen made their first trip to California three years before this, 1872. So, again, the work is building in California. The Whites are spending time out there, and J.H. Wagner moves to California. Um, the reference to that is in the second volume of Ellen White's biography, page 467. Six years later, at the age of 61, he's appointed editor of the Signs of the Times. Now, where is the signs being published? Okay. Oakland, California, Pacific Press, this press that James White has established on the West Coast. So, I'm taking this man... You can picture what James would may be thinking. I'm taking this man who's, a, who's a, an accomplished editor and publisher, and I'm going to move him from Battle Creek, and I'm going to put him in charge of, a, of, a, of the press there on the West Coast, make him uh, the editor of Signs. And he was editor of that Signs through 1866. 1885, at the age of 65, he's appointed editor of the Pacific Health Journal, and he's that until 1887. Now, I don't know exactly what year this was taken, but this picture of him probably was in, the, in that era of time, when he's in his 60s. Um, looks about like, like that vintage. Um, not, not one of the younger ones where he was in his 30s <laughs> when he first joined the work. 1886, he's 66 years old. He's appointed editor of the American Sentinel, and he's that until 1887. So Signs of the Times, Pacific Health Journal, and American Sentinel. And if you recall the reasons for the American Sentinel, there were people being arrested for working on Sunday because there were state Sunday laws that were being enforced. In fact, one time they arrested them, as I understand it, at the Pacific Press for running the press on Sunday. And um, so they said, you can imagine, we must publish on religious liberty. And they began the American Sentinel in 1887, <clears throat> 1886, and he was, he was editing that until the next year. We have to add another thing about his family life at this point, which I think will maybe trouble some people, but also will help us to understand the type of people God had to work through. We saw earlier that Ellen White had written to him about his wife and a negative influence. And if we were to trace all the letters through that she wrote to him, apparently there was one time in his family life that his wife was untrue to him. And she said that he had a right under the laws of the land and under the laws of God to leave her. And he should have done it. But he did. He took her back. And then not only was he obviously dealing with how to relate. It seems like he went from one extreme to the other is what I'm trying to say. He was, he was overly... Um, letting her do her thing on one hand, and then he swings to the other extreme, and Ellen White begins to write letters to him that he was writing to her in an unreasonably harsh manner. So he began to deal with his wife in a harsh way. Harsh way. And not only that, it appears very plain in the letters that she has written to him, and I've given you references here to the published extracts of these letters. They're in the Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, pages 182 to 193. It's a long section. He's not identified there, but that's who they're written to. He actually at one point withdrew his affections totally from his wife and began to put them on another woman. And Ellen White picked up on this. There was a boat trip that she took. Uh, There's an Adventist who had a boat, sailing boat as I recall, in the San Francisco Bay. And they went out for an excursion, uh, and Ellen White loved the water. 
And J.H. Wagner was there, and I believe it was the, the wife of the man who owned the boat. And Ellen White began to pick up on non-verbal stuff going on between these two people. And she began to realize that there was some affinity uh, taking place here. And so it's very, it's very enlightening if you want to read the letters. It's, uh, it's not easy, to re e easy reading in some respects because it's difficult. She's also writing, um, uh, as you can see, w one of the letters is to Wagner himself. Two of the letters are written actually to uh, G.I. Butler, who's the GC president. And she's writing to him about Wagner. And it's, it's like, what are we going to do with this man? You know, he's, he's, he, it, in essence, she's saying he, he's grown old and gray, and yet he's acting like a teenager. And how can we renew his credentials as a minister? And um, it's troubling. It appears to me, I don't, I don't have clear evidence that, he, that they actually did with, withdraw his credentials. He, they sent him as a missionary to Switzerland. 1887, he sent to Switzerland. He's actually there for two years. But if you read carefully, it, it appears that she says uh, geography didn't solve the problem. You know, he, he, you, you, your heart is not repentant just because you move. <laughs> You know, you may still have these uh, ideas that in your head that are not appropriate. And she, she writes an amazingly strong appeals to him and calls for repentance. And calls, you know, he, she references the men in the Bible who had the same type of issues. And she appeals to their testimony and their, their experience too. So, troubling to read that, but um, again, a light, light for us as well. 1887, like I said, he's gone, he's gone to Switzerland. He's writing there. And in fact, he finishes his last book, From Eden to Eden, an overview of the great controversy. And he's finished that, and he's actually planning to return to the States. And he has drops dead suddenly. He, has a, he dies in Switzerland. And from my understanding, he's buried next to Jane Andrews in the same area. That, that's what I understand. Um, at least uh, they're both buried there in Switzerland. So that is, that is the life of J.H. Wagner, a man who had writing ability, as we saw by what we read, a man who God used in the publishing work, um, very significant, one of the ministries that God's given us to carry the message to the world, a man who had problems, weaknesses. Um, but again, uh, as I like to say, we can't discredit these people totally any more than we can discredit David and Solomon. Otherwise, we have to throw out the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Ecclesiastes and not include a lot of those in the Bible. Um, but we look for repentance. And we pray that, that he was, before his time on earth was ended, he was fully repentant and um, able to, to make uh, peace with God in regard to this weakness that he had. Any other observations or comments that you'd like to make? Uh, about this gentleman and the items that he he was able to bless the movement with. I do think that we find uh, roots of the message of righteousness by faith in the things that he wrote. His son, I think, picked up on those things. Not that they were mirror images of each other. His son actually says <laughs> that I, I do not believe exactly like my father. But... Um, there was a, uh, I think, some light that came came down as well as weaknesses. We will find that later on as we look at uh, the son's life. Well, that then will conclude our review of J.H. Wagner, and let's take to heart the lessons of, uh, even though the God uses us, we must realize that uh, we are. People of like passions, and uh, there's no temptation taking this, but it's common to man, and God will provide a way of escape, no matter what it is. And if we have stumbled, that's right, that's right. And if we do stumble, the answer is repentance, deep, unreserved, heartfelt repentance. And we can thank God for that as well.